Cape Cod, he had ample opportunity to experience and explore both. In the early 1970s, he discovered living history and has been deeply involved ever since, reenacting and teaching history of early colonial America, the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the American Civil War. Over these past 40 plus years, he has served in key positions with a number of large scale living history organizations that have played roles in shaping the hobby of living his history, expanding its reach, promoting safe practices and professionalism. He has also served as commander of several reenacting groups. Joe is a licensed professional mariner and has enjoyed the opportunity to combine his love of history and traditional sailing, serving as captain of the tall ship HMS Bounty and the Continental Sloop Providence. In 1996 and 97, Captain Pereira had the privilege of helping train the United States Navy to sail the USS Constitution in preparation for her bicentennial voyage. You can sometimes find him on the deck of the shallop Elizabeth Tilly as a volunteer, and he's always interested in discussing and teaching celestial navigation. Tonight, we are just delighted to have Captain Pereira join us and present his lecture on navigation in the 17th century. Please join me in welcoming Captain Joe Pereira. Jim, should I just clip on here? So the only thing that failed us tonight was the 21st century <laughs> um, innovations that we were using, including our projector. So I'm going to have to, I feel like Bob Ross, I'm going to have to draw very quickly in order to illustrate what I need to do, make some happy little sales. Um, but well, I'll give in and I'll use the, uh, the lavalier mic which I guarantee I will knock off this lectern before long. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, as Susan said, I, I've been involved in traditional sailing and tall ships since the early 1990s. Um, I've had the privilege of commanding a couple of prestigious vessels. Um, actually, pr probably nothing more prestigious than being here tonight. I consider the General Society of Mayflower Descendants to be one of the single most prestigious historical organizations and certainly genealogical organizations uh, in the United States, if not the world. And it is my deepest pleasure and privilege to be here tonight and uh, have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, we're going to broaden it a little bit, not just navigation. We're going to talk about the 17th century sailors, the rank and file who actually operated these ships that moved uh, cargo and, and persons uh, and wealth throughout all of the oceans of the world in the 17th century. My love of the sea began as a child. My fascination with tall ships began at a very young age. And I can recall very clearly this, this vision that every year the insurance agency that my parents dealt with used to send out a Courier and Ives calendar. How many remember the Courier and Ives calendar? Okay, these beautiful heavy stock printed uh, prints of, of these wonderful Courier and Ives uh, artworks and they were always one or two that were tall ships and they were always this very sleek and very kind of, I'm sorry, sexy clipper ships with the beautiful raked masts and their, their very, very tall suits of sail, beautiful trim hulls. And I used to look at those and I'd ponder over those and I couldn't wait for that month to be over so I could take that, that page down and pour over those and try to understand those, try to understand how this rigging worked, how, what, what made all this happen. I may have been the only 12-year-old child in Taunton where I grew up who bugged my librarian into finding uh, a Young Officer's Sheet Anchor, which is a book that was used by uh, 18th and early 19th century British Royal Navy sailors or officers to learn how to rig ships and would pore over how this actually worked. I would bug my parents incessantly to take me to see the Charles W. Morgan, the USS Constitution, um, any of the, 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 our, our, own, our own Mayflower because I needed to be there. I needed to walk those decks and understand. And I always got in trouble because I'd always grab a line to see what it moved up aloft. 
and eventually some very nice person will come, you're not supposed to touch those things, and I didn't care. <laughs> because the more I read, the more I felt akin to these people. Now, I'll put it in reference. My family sailed from the age of exploration through the whaling era, and then into modern boats for fishing throughout New England waters. That's the heritage that we have. So I feel that it's in the bones. I feel that it is genetic, that you can pass on that love for the sea. Um, President Kennedy, in a, in a beautiful speech, stated one time that the, the salinity in our bloodstreams is the same as the salinity of the ocean. And then when we returned to the ocean, we were doing nothing more than going home. That, that's where we belong. That's where we came from, and that's where we're comfortable. And I think there's a great deal of truth to that. Because I think a lot of people here, especially if you live in this area, or if you live on nearby Cape Cod or, or somewhere along the coast, there's a reason for that. And you find some comfort when you go down to the ocean. You feel some comfort when you stand on the end of a pier. Even if you're not a sailor, it's a connection that, that's, that's well and good. Um, so here I was with these incredible, sleek clipper ships. And then I, my eye had to get used to the big, fat, round boats like HMS Victory, or even my own Bounty, that were not as pretty, not as sleek, not as tall, not as fast. But I got to learn about them and got the appreciation for what they did and what they were, that these were the earlier merchantmen ships, and these were the ships that fought the American Revolution, that these were the ships that carried the great cargoes, that these were the ships of the later exploration. And I really wish I had the pictures at this point. And if you're familiar with, again, let's talk about Mayflower. She's an odd shaped little vessel, isn't she? She's got this high uh, aft castle on her. She's got a high forecastle on her. Not a lot of sail, not particularly a pretty vessel. But she represents a very important age of sail for us, that these ships rigged a little bit differently for the, for the English, for the Dutch, for the Spanish, for the Portuguese, were the ships that really made the greatest difference carrying people and cargoes across the entire known world. And again, I, I grew to feel that kinship with those sailors. We were brethren, just separated by a few hundred years. And I, I urge you to talk to any of the people who are here tonight dressed in period attire, and even a couple who are not, because I know that they're kindred spirits, we all feel that connection. We all feel that, that timeline that just carries us over. So we know that the ships of the 17th century were really the lifeblood. And what we don't know a great deal about, or some of us know a great deal about, but general history doesn't tell us a lot about the men, the guys who sail these ships. We, we know of captains, we know of admirals, we know of battles, but I want to focus on the men, because a ship is a living being at sea, and the men who sail that ship are its muscle. They're working the lines, they're moving the sails. So. I want to try to give you an understanding of who they were and what they lived through. Because we all talk about the romance of the sea. And let me tell you something, if you spend any time on a tall ship, it's not so romantic. <laughs> all right, and we'll put this, we'll put this, into, we'll put this into, into context over the course of this talk. Now, I'm amused that just about every movie we've ever seen about ships in the sea, about sailing, about whaling, about exploration. There's always that one character. He's the craggy old guy, all right? He's weathered from years in the sun and salt air. His teeth are busted and rotted. Ah, he's the sage guy. They all turn to him. Please tell us, Jacob, what do we do in a storm like this? And Jacob always has some wise thing to say. If you encountered that guy in the 17th century, chances are he was probably 40 years old and at the end of his career, probably at the end of his life. And although Hollywood always portrayed this, 
60 whatever, 70 whatever year old guy still at sea, that necessarily was not the case. The life expectancy in England during the first half of the century was 35 years. 35 years for a male. Slightly less here in the colonies. And although no one really records it because no one really cared about these guys, I'm sure it had to be less at sea. The rigors of sailing, the rigors of living that life, probably shorten your life considerably. So we have this caricature in our heads of the pirate with one leg or the hook. That would happen just sailing if your foot was in the wrong place at the wrong time, if your hand was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because the, the dynamics, the power that's in these sails, in these lines as a ship is sailing is incredible. To be able to drive a ship, this heavy, flat, blunt-nosed wooden hull across the sea, all of that energy caused strain. All of that energy caused a great deal of power. And I, I think back to 97 when I actually had the privilege of saying, sailing on the USS Constitution. She sailed that trip under very few sails. But when we set the topsails on that ship and they went boom, and we felt her move under her own power, under wind power for the first time in decades. It was like, okay, I get it. So imagine putting everything up. Imagine putting the stuntsels up. Imagine driving across the ocean to chase an enemy or get away from one. Yeah, not so exciting with the 17th century ships, but still if you did something wrong, somebody's going to get hurt. We used to see people get hurt on the tall ships all the time because they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that rigor of living that life was not all that easy. So we know just by average ages that the bulk of these sailors were young men. And probably starting their, their careers as, as young as 12 or 13 years old, signing on with the ships. We know for a fact, from an economic standpoint, that the bulk of these young men, these sailors, were not from coastal communities, maybe not from a tradition where their families sailed, but rather they were from the inland, where their best hope was to work in a, a grist mill, or maybe apprentice to a blacksmith, etc., cetera, et cetera. Not too exciting. So be they Dutch or be they English, they found their way to the coast. They found their way to those seaports where there was commerce, where there were jobs. And whether you worked in a warehouse or whether you worked helping to rig ships or as a shipwright or whether you took the chance and went to sea, that's where the opportunity was. And of course, that opportunity to go to sea, that was kind of the, that was the flash, right? That's like having a motorcycle today. That's, that's the flash. So some of them took that challenge. Now, again, romance of the sea. If you're brand new on a ship, not much romance at a job. You're going to get some of the most menial tasks, but you're out there. And you're taking that chance and stepping away. So... What does that mean? It means there's less young men to farm. There's less young men to be millwrights. There's less young men to take on those tasks because those tasks really weren't going to pay. So they took the opportunity to go to the coast and go to sea. So let's look at what do the sailors wear? What did the 17th century sailor look like? Not much different than a landsman. Not much different than the person who they left behind. Um, as you can see from any of the, the, the various members standing here, the breeches at the time were these big baggy breeches. You know what? Very convenient if you're going aloft. Very convenient for climbing. Very convenient and very mobile. Maybe a little hot, but still. Most of the sailors, could you grab that smock? Because I'm on a tether here. I feel like my dog in the backyard. <laughs> a lot of the sailors just wore a simple smock. <coughs> All right, like this. It's a canvas, a linen canvas, fairly rugged. This one isn't that dirty yet, Dan. Um, but this, this gave them some level of protection. It protected their shirt. How many shirts do most of you men own? Well, you closets full of them. Sailors didn't have closets full of shirts. So it was kind of important to protect that garment because that garment was 
what you wore every day. It was very, very long. It was basically your underwear. It was your nightshirt. It was everything. And you might have two. One that you might wear going ashore and the other one that you wore at work and you kind of protected it. So something as simple as, as a smock or a cassock like that was, uh, was pretty important. Um, one thing that you see over and over and over again in paintings and sketches and even listed in on, on, if you look at maps, if you look at illuminated maps, and we have some up here that you can take a look at afterwards, there's all these wonderful drawings of sailors doing their little duties. You come up with the thrum cap. And the thrum cap is kind of a combination between, a, I like to say, a ski cap and a fright wig. <laughs> But yet it became kind of the quintessential headgear for sailors of that time period. And if you think about it, we all have wool coats, right? If you wear a wool coat in the rain, what happens? You end up with little beads of water, right? Because all the little fibers on the end of the wool coat catch all that water and help shed it off. Well, there's a whole lot of little fibers that would keep a sailor not only warm, but help keep his head dry with a thrum cap. You didn't see them that much of land but they certainly became part of the uniform of the sailors of that period of time. Um, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I've actually done this before, but <laughs> almost all of these men were illiterate. Had they been taught, had they been able to read and write, they probably would not have to have gone to sea. So they're coming in with the basics. They're coming in with strong young muscles, and they're coming in with a willingness to do something and take a chance. Now, this is going to happen if they're working in a warehouse. This is going to happen if they're working on a ship or if they're stevedores, which is not a term that was used at the time, but if they were working on the docks, certainly youth and vigor helps out. One thing that would happen, certainly if you were working in a warehouse or for a merchant, they may teach you. They may teach you some numbers. They may teach you some rudimentary reading and writing. And they'd kind of let you go so far, but not all the way, because they wouldn't want you to get smarter than them. On a ship, your ability to advance was entirely dependent on your physical abilities, what you learned as far as sail making, what you learned as far as seamanship and handling of a ship, what you could possibly learn of navigation, which was the top level, because that actually required math. Or quite simply, what you could pick up along the way in carpentry, um, in rope work, etc., that would advance you along and make it better for you. And in some cases, that meant that somebody else on board that ship was going to teach you to read, maybe teach you some numbers, maybe teach you to write. That was your formal school. And the person who taught you might have what we consider a third grade education today. And that guy was a Rhodes Scholar on board that ship. <laughs> he was sitting right behind the captain and the navigator as far as his ability to, to handle the simplest things. So you're coming on board with next to nothing. If it didn't fit in your sea chest, which is not the big sea chest that we sell at, at Yield House or whatever these places are, they were pretty small boxes. And that box had to sit very, very close to where you slept. You didn't have a hammock in the 17th century. They really hadn't come into being yet. So you slept on the deck. So you were flat on a wooden deck below, below decks in the ship. If you were smart, you'd rig up some kind of bag. And you might get some hay or some straw, etc. It might have been used hay or straw from the animals that were on board the ship for the captain's meals, etc. It didn't matter. It was softer than sleeping on the deck. And this box had to fit in a nice tidy area. So you're not going to have too much in it. You don't have too much clothing. As you begin to develop your trade, you might have a sailmaker's palm or, sailing, or a sail kit. You might get some rudimentary tools that would, I love the 21st century incursion. It's my minister. Seriously. What are you doing? Um, 
praising Jesus. Um, so you don't have much. You're not burdened with stuff. And if you go from one ship to another, you pick up your box, you put it on your shoulder, and you go to the next ship. I'll also point out that ships at sea in the 18th century, before that and after that, were completely integrated societies. Completely integrated societies. We look at the American Civil War and people jump up and down because the 54th Massachusetts had men of color in the field. The United States Navy had been completely integrated since its inception. And every ship at sea was integrated. See, it didn't really matter. Brown, yellow, black, Native American, Pacific Islander, Pole, Frenchman, didn't matter. Could you haul a line? Could you work up aloft and handle sails? Could you work as a ship's carpenter? Could you cook? Because if you could do that, they didn't care. You're a body. You're a part of the larger scheme. So that when we, when we look at this and we get all the way to World War II and we still had segregated units in the United States Army, the Navy's had that all taken care of centuries before. Didn't matter. That's a small thing, but we live in a world where we like to chop everything into little pieces. I'm Italian-American. I'm Native American. I'm African-Canadian. How many of you know an African-Canadian? I don't know a single one. But we love to chop people up into little bits. On a ship, are you a topman? Yes. We didn't say you're a black topman. Are you a white topman? You're a topman. Get up there. Handle your sail. Go aloft. Let's go. Keep the ship moving. So you have to understand, and, and especially maybe here in Plymouth, because we, we have Mayflower, and, and we have this tremendous heritage right here of this group of 121 people that got on board this ship and, and came over here for something wonderful. Great. There were, and if the number's wrong, forgive me, um, but hundreds of ships were crossing all of the oceans from Europe to North America, South America, and East. They were traveling those routes thousands of miles for tobacco that was grown here, for sugar that was coming out of some of the plantations south of here, for silks from the Orient, for spices from the Orient that were worth more than gold. The Spanish and the Portuguese in any way, shape, or form possible, extracting gold from South America. And the slave trade, because it's not part of our sensibility today, but it was a big part of commerce at the time. So let's stop thinking like 21st century people and look at history. That was all part of it, whether those slaves were being dragged from Africa to what we now call the Caribbean, or whether they were being brought up to plantations in uh, North America and in, in what's now the United States or going back to Europe. It was part of it, valuable cargo. And these ships didn't sail just for fun, they sailed for value. They sailed because there was commerce out there. Those routes were rather extensive. And I, again, I wish I had the, I wish I had the, um, the slides. The Dutch all had the routes that they liked, and the Spanish had the routes that they liked, and the English had the routes that they liked, and eventually they all did this. And eventually, at some point in history, all of these countries were at war with each other. So here's this great wealth moving around the world, extreme wealth moving around the world. What do we get if we have wealth? We have somebody that wants to take it. So whether you look upon it as piracy or privateering, there was a tremendous effort to hurt the other guy by taking his commerce. One of the, the most uh, outlandish uh, deeds of all this was the Dutch West India Company, who spent a tremendous amount of guilders, gold guilders, thousands, millions of dollars to equip privateering fleets to go after Spanish and English ships. What's a privateer? 
Privateer is basically a pirate with a license. <laughs> so privateering is centuries old. It finally ended in, in the Western world uh, around 1854, I believe, is the year that everybody decided it was going to go away, except, of course, for the, the Confederacy and the American Civil War who decided to continue it because they didn't have a navy. A privateering vessel is a privately owned vessel, ergo privateer, that's armed, that is given a license, or what's called a letter of mark and reprisal, that allows that vessel to go, and that letter of mark and reprisal is given by some type of governmental agency, all right, whether it's an earl, a duke, a king, some type of formed government, even here, later in the American Revolution, states would give out letters of mark to attack the ships of the enemy. Now, sometimes it could be very specific. We're at war with the Dutch. Okay, you can go take Dutch ships. Or you're really smart and you write a letter of mark that says you can attack ships of our enemies, just in case everything changes. Because <laughs> God knows we're Europe, and we might just arbitrarily declare war on someone. So we, we're going to chase those ships down as well. So you're a privateer. You're kind of a patriot. Nah. No, you're a capitalist. But you're a capitalist with a license. And that license allowed you to go and attack those ships. Okay. There's a price for that. And the price for that is that you pay a share to the government. You pay a share to investors. So I get you all in a room and I tell you that I'm going to build this wonderful ship and I need money to build this wonderful ship and hire the best captain I can and the best armament I can and we're going to go off against the British. Well, in this case, maybe the Dutch. And you all chip in X amount of money and you own two shares and you own three shares and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody owns a share in this boat. And you hire me as the captain, silly people. And off we go and we take prizes. We capture ships. We capture ships. We're not trying to sink them. We take them. And we get those ships, and we get their crews, and we say to them, are you going to continue to fight against us? And they go, oh, no. <laughs> nope, we get no fight here. And we say, OK, fine, sign here. And we're going to incorporate you into the crew so that we can sail your ship that we just took back someplace where we can sell it. So we go down below, and we inventory all the goods. We went over, they have 2,000 boats of blah, 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 and a pound and a half of this, and everything's in inventory before we even get to shore. And there's a value in the ship itself. So you sell the ship, and you sell all the great stuff on board, and now the accounting comes in because you have to pay your investors, you have to pay whoever gave you the letter of mark, usually between 20 and 30 percent of anything that you take. Go on the high side, it's usually more like 30, 35. You pay your investors off, and you have to pay your crew. They get their shares for what you've done. It got to the point that the, the Dutch West India Company gave up because there were so many investors pouring money into these boats that they were only getting a return of like 2%. And they went, nah, it's no good. So they gave up. Now, if I'm a privateer and I sail for the Dutch, I'm a privateer. And if I encounter a Dutch ship, I wave, and they say, oh, there's Joe, he's a privateer. As soon as I take somebody else's ship, what am I? I'm a pirate. All right? They don't care if I've got a letter of mark. I've just attacked their ship. I've forced them to surrender. Maybe they fought. Maybe some guys bled. Maybe there was horrible stuff that happened. And in the end, I'm a pirate to them. So every privateer is a pirate to somebody. So people love to draw that line and say, oh, no, my ancestor was a privateer. Pfft, not according to the ships he took. <laughs> if you look at it from the period of 1623 to 1637 alone, Dutch privateers took 607 ships. 607 ships. And that amassed to a very large amount of money because the Spanish were bringing home ships laden with gold. The Dutch, who were being attacked by some of the English privateers, were coming back from the Orient laden with spices, which were worth more per ounce than gold. 
or the silks, et cetera. These were the rarities. So when we think about it today, we go to, I don't know, Sofro, whatever the fabric store is today, so sophisticated, I hate those names. And you know, you buy silk. Well, okay, fine. That was, now it's like, oh yeah, I just bought a bolt of silk. No, back then that bolt of silk meant something. So it would come back and get sold in one of the colonies. It would come back and get sold someplace for a lady to have a fine dress, for a gentleman to have a fine, you know, fine waistcoat or a suit. So kind of the Rolex of the day, I suppose. <laughs> the crossings themselves were no small thing. To come from Europe to the Americas to come into New England or to come into New York, depending on the time of, of year you were traveling, could take you from one and a half to two and a half months. Think about that. If any of you have ever taken a cruise and you're out for five days, seven days, or if you ever had a chance to cross the, uh, cross the Atlantic on, on the QE2 or something like that, psh, matter of days, boom, 27 knots, whoo, there you go, sailing across the ocean. Two and a half, one and a half to two and a half months on a small ship, sleeping on the deck. And if you're traveling as someone looking to move from Europe to the Americas, you're not used to being on a ship. You're probably sick. You're not used to the food. It's more romance of the sea. You're not used to the food, which is pretty bad. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We have some <laughs> delightful, uh, delightful visuals on that. So, and it took less time to go back to Europe because of the prevailing winds and tides. All right, so if it took you a month and a half to get here, you'd probably get home in four weeks. But you're not going home. The sailors are going home. They're taking from whatever they got here and taking it back to Europe for trade and then waiting for the next batch of people who want to come over here. Um, these were not heavily crewed vessels. So tomorrow we're going to be representing the three ships that sailed into Plymouth Harbor. We say ships. And in fact, I think Bradford calls them men of war. <sighs> wow. I think of men of war, I think of the HMS Victory with 100 guns, and I think of the USS Constitution. <sighs> and they had 80 men. Oops. A man of war would have hundreds of men. So it tells us that these men of war that came into our harbor here were actually very small ships, probably about 100, 120 ton vessels. Not so big. Um, two of them were Spanish. They were captured. They were prizes um, of these, these privateers who brought them in. They were on their way to Boston. They would hope to sell them in Boston. They couldn't sell them in Plymouth because Plymouth was poor. As a matter of fact, were it not for them sailing in in 1646, Plymouth may have gone out of business. I don't know what would be here now. I don't know. Kingston South? I, I really don't know, but it would have been very different. There probably wouldn't be a rock. But it's funny, we think about that, and here it is, it's a thriving tourist community. And it was really only a tourist community from the 1920s, right? That's when they decided, oops, we don't have any commerce, let's make money somehow. Let's get a rock. <laughs> I'm not making fun of the rock, I love the rock. I just love standing there whenever somebody from far away, where are you from? Kansas. It's like, why'd you come? We came to see the rock. It's right there. <laughs> Must have been a short boat they got off of. They don't get it, but that's okay. So the ship's companies were rather small. A ship of 400 ton, and I, I, I like to use that as a reference point. That was the size of Bounty. You probably only had 30 crew members to run that ship. You had less sail on a 17th century ship than you had on an 18th century ship or on a 19th century ship. And that meant that if you had 30 men on board, that you were working in watches, uh, break up your day into four-hour shifts or watch, and in that four-hour watch, you'd have 10 men working. Now, obviously, if there was a storm, all hands would be on deck. If you were leaking, all hands would be on deck. And 
but it was pretty minimal. A warship, yes, you'd have more men. Why? Because it takes five guys to run every one of the ship's guns, the cannons. So you'd have all those guys to handle the ship and make it go someplace. The carpenters and the carpenters' mates down below to make sure the ship didn't sink. And then the men who actually handled the, um, the ship's guns or artillery. We like to say in wooden ships that every wooden ship is in a constant state of sinking. <laughs> How many people here have owned a wooden boat? Okay, They are in a constant state of sinking. So what does that mean? It means that they need a lot of work and it's constant. You're talking natural materials, natural fibers. You're talking planked wooden hulls that as the sea moves, the ship's hull works. You're talking ship's hulls that are stacked in between with the, the planks with oakum in order to help keep the water out. And a ship that's moving. Again, think of all that torque, all that pressure from all that rig. And the ship has to move because if it was built so rigid that it couldn't move, it would break. So if you think of hemp line, it's somewhat flexible, so it gives. If you think of wood, it gives. But if it gives too much and the storm is too great, it begins to leak. So what kind of work are you doing on board a ship if indeed you are a sailor on one of these ships? Well, in your four hour watch, nobody sat down. Nobody said, oh, I'm taking my coffee break now. <laughs> You're gonna be dealing with sail handling. You're gonna be holy stoning the decks. You know what that is? Holy stone's a rock. It's a kind of a pumice rock. And you smooth the decks down with it because otherwise the decks begin to, to wear and splinter. So in the old days, they were called a holy stone because they were about the size of a, of, of a Bible. And Bibles weren't cute little things this big. Bibles were big things. And you'd be pushing this stone across a wetted deck in order to help refine that deck. Um, you may be swabbing the decks down with salt water because salt water kept them pure. If you take too much rainwater or sweet water, as we call it, onto a wooden deck, it's, it's going to begin to deteriorate it. You, if you're skilled as a sail maker, you might, might be up aloft or sitting on the deck or sitting down below mending sails because sails tear. That was linen canvas that was used at the time. It stretches, it sags, it bags, and in a bad storm, it, it certainly may tear. You may be working with a ship's carpenter. You may be a carpenter's mate helping to stop the leaks. And sometimes that meant going through the boat, crawling through the boat each and every day to find out if there was water coming in. And I can guarantee there's water coming in. So the question is, can I find where it's coming from and can I stop it or at least slow it down? You might be standing lookout. I hate the whole land ho thing, but you had to stand lookout, not just looking for land, and we'll talk about navigation in a minute, but what else is on the horizon? If I've got a Spanish ship, and I've got a few tons of gold down below, I want to know everything that's near me. All right. If I'm a privateer, I want to know everything that's near me. Because unless they're flying under the same flag I'm flying under, I want to go get them. Hoping that they're an enemy of whoever gave me my letter of mark. Um, you may, You'd take a turn at the helm. You'd actually get an opportunity to steer the vessel. You'd work aloft because rigging wears out. Rigging needs mending, etc. You may get put over the side in a bosun's chair to do some, some painting or some tarring of the hulls. Uh, there may be livestock on board the ship. Why livestock? Well, you might be transporting livestock, first of all. Or there may be livestock on board for the officer's food, not for yours. All right. Uh, you might be assisting the cook, and the list goes on and on and on. Nobody had time off. When you were done, as I said, you went below deck, you curled up on, on, the, um, on the deck. Hammocks didn't exist until the 1670s, and they weren't that popular then. So we talked about some of the trade routes. How did we get from point A to point B? How many here actually sail? Okay, I kind of figured that. What are the two parameters that we look at a map under? Latitude. Longitude and longitude, or longitude. We understood, we as a people understood, that there was latitude and longitude. That latitude was our position north and south on the map, and longitude, or as the British like to say, longitude, was our position east and west. Latitude was pretty easy. And I'll show you some of that. Latitude was pretty easy just by taking stellar sightings, including 
our own, sun, our own star, the sun, the most important sighting you take every day was your noontime sighting. Longitude, even Galileo tried to figure out. And up to three centuries before uh, the modern age, you had various scientists trying to figure out how to understand where we are east and west. And somebody finally clicked in and realized it's a product of time. If you set a universal clock in one place, and I can take a reading that tells me what time it is here, your noontime sighting, and I have a universal clock that tells me what time it is at that place, I can figure out where I am across the face of the earth, east and west. Nice. Some other scientists figured out over time, before that magical clock showed up, that, thank you, that um, you could take the distance of the moon. Try to take the distance of the moon when you're on the deck of a moving ship. Try to do those calculations. Try to do that math. Not so easy. So it wasn't until the 18th century and deep into the 18th century that that magical clock was finally developed that would keep accurate time at that one central place, which we today know as, as Greenwich, Greenwich Mean Time, that every ship on uh, every clock on every ship for navigation purposes is set to Greenwich Mean Time. And your position on the Earth is determined by the time you're at, according to the sun or stars, is compared to Greenwich Mean Time. So latitude's easy. <laughs> Piece of cake. Throw me a quadrant, would you? <laughs> So the most rudimentary way of it's actually a quiz. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> so there's a number of instruments that were used in, in prior to the 17th century and, and even beyond that allowed us to look at the stars or look at the, look at the sun. Okay, you can come up and look at this later. There's two peepholes in this. Right, a peephole here and a peephole here. What am I going to do with that? I'm going to watch the sun rise in the sky because I want noontime. And I want to find what's called a point of declination of the sun. I want to realize the point where the sun has reached its zenith and just come down. Oops, it's coming down. So now I know I've just missed noon, so I've got to grab this. So I'm going to squint my eye, and I'm going to look through these two peepholes directly into the sun, and no Ray-Bans, and on a moving ship, all right, as the deck pitches and rolls, and I want to capture the angle that the sun is above the horizon. And then I'm going to go to a set of almanacs that says, at this time of year, where on the face of the planet, in this case, north of the equator, is the sun this many degrees above the horizon at noontime? And that's going to tell me where I am north and south. Great. Squinty. By the way, this was invented by the Arabs, not by Europeans. And they could do tremendous celestial calculations using this simple instrument and notations that were made on the back of it. That it took the Europeans decades, if not centuries, to figure out. Could you throw the um, astrolabe, please? Yep, that's the one. Yay. Process of elimination. Okay. <laughs> so with an astrolabe, it's the same principle. And it's a difficulty factor because now you have to hang this thing from your finger, but you see it always levels itself, right? And it's the same thing. You've got a scale on here. And again, you're going to sight through two peepholes, and you're going to stare directly at the sun on a moving deck of a ship without hitting yourself in the head with this thing and determine the same thing, point of declination of the sun, what the number of degrees above the horizon the sun is at noontime. Did we put together? Yeah, I'd throw over the cross staff. All right. If you go on board um, Mayflower, you find a cross staff. And the cross staff is pretty cool. You don't use all the veins at the same time, but it depends on how high the sun is. And in the cross staff, you have the magical thing that you look down the staff, you put one end on the horizon. And at the same time, you're looking at the horizon and you're looking here because you want to put the sun right here. And when you can do that, you can take a reading of the degrees above the horizon, staring at the sun. Cool. Um, 
I'm blind as a bat, and it wasn't from staring at the sun. My mother tells me it was other things. Um, <laughs> if I could have the back staff, please. And I don't know if I pulled out the veins. Yeah, I didn't. Vein. Okay. So some genius along the line came up with the back staff. Now, if you look at it, she's kind of reminiscent of where we were going with the sextant, octant, et cetera, right? This one's brilliant. You didn't have to stare at the sun anymore. You turned your back to the sun. And if I had unpacked everything, there would be a sighting vein here, which is a piece of wood that would move. It has a hole in it. And there'd be a vein here that would stick out. And the idea was, now with this, I'm going to put this slot on the horizon. And I'm going to move these two veins until I can land the shadow of this one on the horizon. How would I do that? I turn my back to the sun. And I try to do this on a moving ship. But I didn't have to stare at the sun anymore. So what's the problem with this one? I can't take star sightings at night. But I've got these other instruments to take star sightings at night, and they don't hurt my eyes. So a lot of the stellar sightings, depending on where you were on the universe, on the, the planet, north, south, etc., you would look at Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Polaris as we know it today, key stars in the end of constellations or within constellations that would help you figure out where you were north and south. People ask me all the time, well, what happens if it rains? A, you get wet. <laughs> and B, you have a bit of a problem. Let me step back one thing. So east and west was dead reckoning. And I'll show you just in a moment how we kind of look at charts in order to figure out where we are was dead reckoning, which meant that if I was sailing from Europe and I wanted to hit New Amsterdam, I wanted to hit New York, I know the latitude of New York. So I'm going to try to get on that latitude and hold there as much as I can. That's really great if I've got big steam engines. I just, here I go, straight line. Not so good if I'm sailing because I'm subject to the wind and tides. So I have to keep coming back to that. I have to keep coming back to that latitude. If we were running from Europe to the Americas, it's called running a westerly. If we're going the opposite direction, it's running an easterly. So you're hitting that, that latitude as best you can. And yeah, somebody's going to yell, land, ho, when you finally get close to a, a, body, of, a, a body of land. may not be what you want, but at least then you can start looking and trying to figure out are there things on shore that I can identify? Is there anything that, that I can nail down? Gee, I didn't really want to be in Guernsey. I wanted to be someplace else, but that's where we are. And you can figure out where to go from there. It's not very efficient running easterlies, running westerlies. Dead reckoning is not the best way to go. But it's what they had without longitude. I think, and, and I, I invite you to come and look at some of the maps, we kind of laugh at some of the early charts because things don't look like we know they look. How many times have you seen Cape Cod and it looks like it's, you know, it's really small and it's really fat or, or the distance between England and the United States is huge or it looks like it's, across, it's, it's right across the street. Part of the problem was not, lo not knowing exactly where you were in longitude. So in balancing all those things together, the charts weren't that great. And yes, as you explored a harbor, if you sailed into New York, there would be charts for, for New Amsterdam Harbor. There would be charts for Boston Harbor. There would be charts for Plymouth Harbor, which still to this day are terrible. Um, only the sailors get that. Um, but you'd have a better understanding. Every mariner marked up his charts. The greatest thing in the world is when you find an antique chart, not the one that's hanging in a frame someplace, but the one a captain took to sea because somewhere penned in there is a rock that nobody else knew about. Somewhere in there is, is a cove that nobody else had caught on a chart. So if you are a privateer or a pirate and you capture a ship as a navigator, I want the other guy's charts because those charts are the software that runs the ship. That's the software that runs the ship. The operating system is all these wonderful tools that help us get from point A to point B. But if that guy had sailed into harbors that I'd never been to, I want his stuff, okay? 
So part of dead reckoning is trying to figure out where you are at any point. We're all familiar with the ship's bells, right? All right, every half an hour on the ship, ding, a bell rings, okay? It rings for a certain number of rings between one and eight, and that's not between one o'clock and eight o'clock, that's each half hour on a watch. So a watch begins at, let's say at midnight, eight bells are sounded, end of one watch, beginning of the other. Half hours are always rung on uh, an odd number, full hours are always rung on an even number. Easy enough. When you get to seven bells, if you're on, I got a half hour to go before I'm off. And if you're coming on, it's like, ugh, I gotta wake up, I gotta go to work. But that divided the day. And one of the cool things that would happen is we take our noontime reading and squinting into the sun or, or playing with shadows, we figure out where we are, north and south. So the dead reckoning part kind of comes into keeping track. So a couple of things happen when we, I don't know how far this goes. I can't stand standing still. I'm gonna drive Jim crazy. Let's follow Joe. So on every bell, a couple of things happen. We look at a compass. Compasses haven't changed a whole lot. It's a magnetic, this is a dry compass, which is what they had at the time. You got a magnetic disc or magnetized disc with, actually the disc is not magnetized. It's a pen under here that's magnetized. And that always points north, magnetic north, not true north. I'm not gonna drive you crazy. Um, but it's dry card, which means it's just sitting on a pen and rotating on that pen very loosely and it will point north. So, at the sound of the ship's bell, ding, somebody at the helm is gonna look down at that compass and make a notation of where we're going. What is this? It's not a cribbage board, all right? Ship's cribbage. Um, if you come up and take a closer look at it, you realize that this disc is nothing more than the compass rows. Okay, north up here, this one's not that pretty. It's pretty simple, you gotta look at it closely. There's eight rings, all right? 32 cardinal points of the compass. All right, so each of the cardinal points of the compass is laid out on here in eight concentric rings. So on the first bell of the watch, ding, somebody walks over, looks at the compass and says, we had to do north, and they put in a pen. And every half hour, they put in a pen. So at the end of four hours, we know which way we were going in 30 minute increments. Maybe more important is we figure out how fast we're going. Ah, this is fun. So there were a number of ways to do this. Ha, I feel like my dog running across the yacht. Um, so what do we do? What's the best way to tell what speed we're going? Well, everybody kind of worked at it, and I'm gonna give you this one because this is kind of a good idea of what happened. And this kind of, I'm very happy to say, came from the Portuguese. Um, but there were other ways to do this, but this is what everybody kind of leveled with. This is called a Taft rail log or a chip log, all right? It's a big ball of line. And I'm gonna tell you that every uh, five fathoms or 30 feet on this one is a knot. Sometimes it's seven fathoms, sometimes it's others, and your, your sand glass tells you which, which it's going to be. But there's a knot on each one. So it's a two-man operation. One guy holds this, yay. One guy throws the chip into the water. The chip is weighted. It's got a lead weight in the bottom. So the idea is the chip goes into the water, splash, and basically it stops as the ship sails away from it. As soon as that hits the water, this thing's gonna kill me. As soon as that hits the water, in this case, you flip over that glass, it counts out 28 seconds. I don't know what evil magician figured this out, but it works. So for 28 seconds, line goes out, okay? And every 30 feet, every six fathoms, five fathoms rather, is a knot. And I can't even get to the first one. But the point is that when that glass stops, you stop the line and you count the number of knots that have left this reel. That's your speed in knots. So what became translated as nautical miles per hour in AUT actually came from K-N-O-T. Or if you really can't spell and you're in old England, it's N-O-T, T. Maybe has an E on the end because spelling was very inconsistent. So you take that and now at the end of a four hour watch, you've got a graphic representation on here of what direction I went. 
and how fast I was going every half hour. So now this can go to the navigator who can translate kind of where we are. Because you know, yes, sir? Could they figure out SOG? Pardon? Could they figure out SOG? No. No. <laughs> that, that unfortunately came a lot later. So thank you. So it, it gave us an idea, OK? Set and drift is a problem that they had to deal with, figure out how that's going to work. There were a lot of things that were not that linear that they hadn't figured out over time. Um, if you took a bad sun sighting, you could end up dozens of miles, hundreds of miles off. If you weren't calibrated, if that sand glass was only putting out 24 seconds or putting out 34 seconds, you're in trouble because all your speeds were off. So we're dealing with very simple mechanical items. It's a miracle anybody ever got anywhere. <laughs> but they did, all right? Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder about that. So you're, you're moving, and I've taught this stuff, and it's really funny because you line up, you line up four cadets on the taff rail of a ship, and everybody's got their little plastic sextant, all right? And everybody takes their readings, and everybody goes back to the almanac, and they figure out where they are. I've been off Nantucket and had somebody told me that I'm in Bayonne, New Jersey. <laughs> because if you don't understand, and it's practice. Practice makes perfect with anything, right? If you're going to play guitar, you're not going to sound like Jimi Hendrix the first day out. But, um, or Les Paul, got to put things in perspective. Um, it takes practice. But if you're in a storm, say you get four days of rain. You can't imagine that, you're sailing from England. North Atlantic, New England. Yes, I can imagine that. You can't take your solar sighting. You can't take your star sighting. That's it. The whole thing is dead reckoning at that point. Which direction did we go? How fast did we go? Now, the how fast did we go becomes a real problem because of tides. All right, I may think I'm going five knots, but I'm sailing against the tide. I'm really going negative one knot. Or I'm sailing with the tide, and I think I'm going two knots, and I'm going seven. And those are the things that, unless they were familiar with the harbor and the turn of the tides, et cetera, that they wouldn't know. And that's what got them into trouble. I always love the fact, especially here in New England, we have rocks, and all the rocks have names. All right? Who the hell are they named after? The guy that hit the rock. All right? I never want Pereira's rock. But... It's really what it comes down to. What a great way to be remembered if you're a sea captain. So that's that. That's just, a, a, and again, we can talk about all this later. So a sailor needs fuel, right? Ships need fuel. We have wind. What fuels the sailor? Oh, this is the best. If you're going to sea, food has to be preserved, yes? What was the preservation at the time? Wasn't a nice little can? Wasn't a jar? All right. Salt. So you had salted meat, salted fish. Doug, did you bring some of the good stinky stuff? Aw, nope. Salt, 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 salt. You had the ship's biscuit that was about the consistency of this lectern, which would last forever as long as it didn't get wet. Bugs would get into it, weevils. Mm. Probably the only source of protein the men actually had. So. I, I, I kid you not. So in order to eat this salted meat, this dried bread, you had to soak it. Mm. Fresh water? No. Nah. Because water would foul. So you had to come up with a way to keep the water somewhat fresh. Well, one way was to substitute the water with beer or wine because they're not going to go bad. Now, I don't say beer like we've gone out and got the 11.5% alcohol IPA from the craft beer cellar. They're small beers. They're between 3 4% alcohol because you couldn't be drunk on duty. But part of your ration was a gallon of beer a day. A gallon of beer a day. Think about that, all right? I'm sorry, that's a baseball fan's heaven. All right? I want to watch the socks and drink a gallon of beer. So 
you had your beer or wine, depending on what nation your ship was from or what you could get. And you had all this wonderful dried food, peas, oatmeal, salted, salted, salted meats that you would soak and try to get the salt out of them, try to get them soft enough so that you could eat. You'd be broken down into a mess. And I don't mean the way I look tonight. You'd be broken down into a mess. So if you were the third watch, maybe you were the starboard mess or the larboard mess so that you'd have a percentage of your crew that would get together and they take their stuff, their rations, and try to turn it into something. If the officer on board the ship was having bacon or some type of fatty soft meat that was preserved as well, you'd really want to talk to the cook and try to wangle your way into getting some of that fat. Because I can take that fat and I can mix it with that mashed up hardtack biscuit. I can make something that's fairly palatable. All right, or I can mix that with the peas, or I can mix that with the oatmeal, and I can get something that's fairly palatable. Let me read you your meal plan. <laughs> so, in a day, a sailor would, uh, would get for himself one pound of biscuits, one gallon of beer, yay, a half a pint of rum or brandy, depending on where you were and what they could get. We all know that sailors drank rum mm, until the British Royal Navy took it away, boo, and sad day. Um, that's each day. Four pounds of beef, two pounds of salt pork, <laughs> three eighths of a 24 foot, uh, 24 inch codfish, two pints of peas, six ounces of butter, and between eight and 12 ounces of cheese weekly. Okay, so those are your weekly rations. Does it sound like a great diet to any of you? Calorie count was about 3,500 to 4,500 per day. At, at the level of activity I have, if I ate 4,500 calories per day, I'd be as wide as that mirror. But these guys were working hard every day. These guys were climbing. These guys were hanging on for their lives. These guys were doing some very, very difficult work. And these guys were as hard and sinewy as the junky meat that they ate. Fresh vegetables would be taken on when you came into port. Nice. Um, merchant ships may have more livestock on board. You might get an egg. Go for that egg. But fresh food, soft bread, anything that wasn't salted, anything that wasn't dried was a rarity. Well, when you salt meat so badly, you begin to take what we know today as vitamins and nutrients out of it. They didn't really have an understanding of vitamins at the time. So you had sailors that were eating a vitamin-deprived diet. One of those primary vitamins is vitamin C, and a lack of vitamin C gives you a disease called scurvy. Your teeth begin to fall out, your joints begin to break down, and eventually you die if it gets that bad. You can't serve the ship anymore, you're an invalid, and eventually you just die. Between the years 1500 and 1800, to what we know, two million sailors died of scurvy, a 300 year period. All right. Not of gunshot wounds, not of being wrecked at sea, None of that counts. Scurvy, one simple disease, two million sailors. And those are the ones we know about. Some of the captains and some of the surgeons on board these ships had figured out when my guys eat fresh food, they're not sick. But they didn't understand the chemical scientific aspects of it. Some of the nations kind of figured, it out, kind of figured some things out. I'm going to give a kudo to the Portuguese again. The Portuguese inhabited St. Helena as a, as a colony, and they planted groves of fruit trees there. So on their way to the Orient, they would stop there. They'd drop off all the men who were sick. They'd pick up anybody there who was not sick, and they'd revamp the crew to move on. And then on the way back, they'd drop off all the sick men who had scurvy. They'd pick up all the guys who had been eating fruits for the last few weeks, several weeks, excuse me, several weeks, and off they'd go. 
but they still didn't understand the science behind it. But slowly but surely, ship's captains were beginning to realize that if I'm eating fruit, especially citrus fruits, gee, the guys are good. The other thing that worked out really well was sauerkraut, very rich in vitamin C. Think of a bunch of guys on board a ship eating sauerkraut. It's that, it's that romance of the sea thing again that I, that I keep coming back to. So this was not an easy life by any stretch of the imagination. Add to that would-be settlers who are traveling to other parts of the world. Not just, not just the little band packed into Mayflower, but all of those dozens and dozens of ships. 500 voyages within a couple of decades, bringing settlers from various points in Europe to various points into what is now our United States. Whether it was Virginia or the New York uh, or you know, New Amsterdam colonies or, or here uh, in New England. Folks like you. Not sailors, not like this guy, all right? Not sailors. And you're packed into the ship. You're not getting better food than the crew. You're not probably even getting on deck because you're greenhorns and you'll be in the way and you might get washed overboard. So you're stuck down below. You're probably seasick. You're probably feeling a level of malnourishment. If there's livestock on board, I'm sorry, livestock creates certain products that we do as well, but if you pack that all into a very tight space, it doesn't smell that great. You do have a stove and an oven on board a ship. You have a wood-burning fire on board a ship in, in the tween decks for cooking. And that smoke is tumbling through the ship. That heat is tumbling through the ship. That soot is tumbling through the ship. Sleeping on the floor, you're not bathing. There's no showers on board the Mayflower. So you're in the most raw human form. You're not feeling well. You're hoping there's something good at the end of this trip. I keep thinking of the pilgrims when they hit P-Town and went, sand. <laughs> we have sand. <laughs> Thank you, Captain. Seriously, imagine that. They're, they're going to an established colony. They're headed down to, to, to the New York colony. They're going into the East River. Mm -mm. They got sand and then a rock. So not make, yeah, in December. So not making fun of it, but talk about the unknown. You're not going to go to the princess at that point and say, I, I want a refund. <laughs> You're stuck. But people took that chance. And this is where my romance of the sea comes in. It's not from the stink of the ships. It's not from the bad food. They're vehicles, not just to move across the ocean, but to move across times, to move across cultures. They took you someplace that could hopefully be better than where you were. And I think of those sailors, those poor guys who left a farm someplace, and wander to the dockside until they got a job on board a ship. And what did they see? They came to New England and they saw Native Americans that they never saw before. They saw forests like didn't exist in England or Holland. They got to the east and they saw the beauties of Asia. They saw things that the bulk of people, the richest people on the planet at that time would not see. Sure, the king could have somebody bring him back silks, the king could have him bring him back people and animals to play for him in court, but he couldn't see the places. That's a romance of the sea. The romance of the sea is taking the chance of getting on that small boat and going someplace where you're going to have a better life and fighting for that better life. 19th century, it was wagon trains moving across the country. Eh, you know what? Wagon trains are rolling on soil, and you're in charge. I got my horses, here I go. You weren't in charge on these ships. That's the romance of the sea for me. And in that period of time, it was probably the most risky, probably the craziest. And if you're sailing with goods and you're afraid of a pirate jumping you or a privateer jumping you, I guess that just added to the excitement. What's gonna happen next? 
or if you are that privateer and you come back with that great prize and you bring it into a port and sell it, it's full of Spanish gold. You never have to work a day again for the rest of your life. But you know what? You probably go back to sea just because that's all you know. So that's a 17th century sailor in a very roundabout way. I'm more than happy to take any questions. If there are none, I thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. I hope it was worthwhile for everybody and somebody got something. <laughs>